In, in this small session of applied mathematical finance, I like to do a small programming experiment with you. So um, I would like to use now the components we have studied in the previous session. So our interest rate model with the Euler scheme, Brown in motion and so on. Um, and I would like to check a few things. Yeah? You remember that we have here an implementation of an interest rate model. For example, that guy here. And this guy is already quite flexible because we can specify different numerators, spot and terminal measure. We can also specify different state spaces for the time discretization scheme, yeah, the measure transform. And we can also specify something like uh, the simulation time uh, interpolation and so on. So interpolation will be done at another another in another session. And I would like to study a little bit here these uh, things. For example, let's start by studying what does it mean to change the numeria to change the simulation measure. So we create a simple model for um, our numerical test using our building blocks. Um, I have here a class which I call now model factory, which creates here our term structure model based on a few parameters which I provide. So this little model factory, I already prepared it here in um, our lecture repository. And you can specify here a string with the measure, which can be terminal or spot, uh, some interpolation method. You can specify a, a constant forward rate, um, a period length, uh, a volatility. There is here some Boolean parameter I will explain later. Uh, some parameters that specify the vol local volatility model. Also very simple volatility models, yeah, just three parameters, one for the volatility, one for the log normal versus normal interpolation parameter, and one for the correlation parameter. So a very small and simple uh, model. So let me shortly walk through this implementation here on the slides. Um, so what am I doing? So first I define here some time discretization. So you see there is here time discretization. This is the forward rate period discretization. So these are the capital TIs that I'm specifying here. And you see, I'm just taking here this parameter um, period length. So forward rate period length, I'm taking this parameter here from my parameter list. This is here the period length. Then the next step is to define the initial values. So I define here the initial values. So these guys here are my Li of T0. Yeah? So um, you remember that I mentioned you can define a forward rate curve or a discount curve. So discount curve is the curve of zero copper bond prices. So my toolbox here provides this um, interface of a curve, but here I just define the forward rate curve in terms of constant forward rates. So there is a parameter here, forward rates. So this is a flat curve. Yeah, it's just constant initial values. So all the initial values here are the same. So this is the forward rate. Okay, so this curve defines the initial value for my stochastic process. Then I also define a discount curve. So there is some Boolean here, use discount curve. And if this Boolean use discount curve is set, so here I'm asking for this Boolean, then we he will also create a discount curve object from 
this forward curve. So he will create the corresponding analytic zero Cooper bond prices. So these guys here are the analytic zero Cooper bond prices. So PTI observed in T0. You can provide to the model the analytic zero Cooper bond prices by this object if you like to. Uh, this will be relevant later. Uh, if it is null, yeah, he, he does not have the anal analytic values. So we can create here this discount curve. Then in the next step, I'm creating the time discretization little ti. So this is the time discretization for my Euler scheme. So you see, I use the time discretization twice here, once for the tenors, once for the Euler scheme. So um, my time discretization is here using the same period lengths as before. So I'm stepping here, for example, in half years. Yeah? Okay, and my time horizon is 20 years. So my model only lives up to 20 years. You can also make this a parameter if you like. This is just here for, for testing and it's a little bit hard coded that I have this time discretization. Okay, so that was already the part of the little ti or the little tj, maybe I should call it, let's call it tj because i is already the index for the tenor discretization. Then comes a block that specifies the covariance model. So this here is the specification. Of the lambda i k. And I already mentioned to you that I would like to have a model framework where I can plug in different um, specifications for volatility, correlation, and so on. So I have here three parts. So this first part here is specifying the sigma i to be constant. So this is just a single parameter sigma. So this parameter sigma is here my volatility parameter. So you see that I set here all this to a constant. I'm creating an array of piecewise constant values and then I'm just filling this array. And I'm creating here this volatility model. Then the second part, is creating the correlation model. So this second part is the creating the correlation. And here my correlation is some exponential function. So you see here is the row specified. So there is a certain class providing this exponential decay function which depends a little bit that forward rates which are further apart are more independent. Uh, forward rates that are further apart are more independent. This is a very classical, classical model. We can study the dependency on this parameter maybe in some later session. So this third part here is actually then combining the lambda i case. Well, from volatility and correlation, so this is sigma i times f i k, where f i k is creating the correlation. Okay, so that's the third part. And nice is now the fourth part here. So number four. Number four is creating now the blending of a log normal and a normal model. So this is here a blended local volatility model. So there is this parameter local vol normal normality blend. So this is a parameter between zero and one. So this is here this parameter. So this is my parameter alpha. Yeah, in the, in the lecture we call it I believe alpha. So it is alpha times li plus one minus alpha sigma i 
DWI. Yeah, okay, so something, something like that. So you see that here in this part here, I'm specifying the covariance structure and I have also different modules, volatility, correlation, volatility plus correlation are building covariance. And then I can also specify here this mixture of log normal and normal with this um, pl pl planning. Uh, we will study the dependency on the volatility in another session. Yeah, so maybe we can skip that part. Here, I just define a few properties. For example, we define here the measure. So this measure is a, a parameter that can be a, a string being spot or terminal. This parameter is also provided here to my function. It's here, I'm providing the measure. Okay, uh, the model does not do any um, calibration. So this last line on this slide, you can ignore it. There are no products. You can calibrate the covariance structure to certain products. And then we are done. So here is the, the previous part with this measure. And then we are done building this model. So we all put this now into our term structure model with a given covariance. So we combine all the guys that we have created, the initial values, the time discretization, and the covariance model. We put this all into this guy. This is the guy that we have looked at where we, where we defined the drift, the numerea. Yeah. Um, and then comes just the three lines. Okay, this is now our process model. So this is the major guy specifying the initial value for our Euler scheme, the drift, the factor loadings. So it was the Lambda IK, this state space transform. Yeah. This is providing this to an Euler scheme. So there is the Euler scheme here. And we also had our Brownian motion again. So there's again my Brownian motion here. And then I'm wrapping this up uh, in my little wrapper. So the wrapper that we had in the previous session that provides now the forward rates and the numeraire. So I have this little model factory that can create um, some interest rate model, some Monte Carlo simulation based on a few simple parameters. And I would like to study this now a little bit. So maybe we have time to just create this here. Let's call this term structure Monte Carlo simulation experiments. Huh? So we do some experiments. I would like to have a main method. And the first thing I would like to do is to test the zero Cooper bond prices. So let's create here this little method, test zero copper bond prices. So why are zero copper bond prices of interest? Well, the time discretization of the Euler scheme and also the Monte Carlo discretization has now a dependency on the equivalent martingale measure because the drift will create different errors. The discretization of the drift has different errors. The drift depends on the measure and an error in the drift will ultimately lead to an error in the zero copper bond price. So here you see the value of a zero copper bond. The value of the zero copper bond is just the expectation of our numeraire 
at evaluation time divided by numerea at payment time of the zero Cooper bond. So here's the payment time of the zero Cooper bond. And our numerea is a complicated functions of the forward rate and the forward rates contain the drift. So the zero Cooper bond does not depend on the volatility, but of course it will maybe also show a an error depending on the volatility because the volatility appears in the drift and the error could be larger there in the drift if the volatility is different. So I would like to study this guy. Uh, here are the two different measures, terminal measure and spot measures with the two different numerias and the two different drifts. So let's study this guy. Um, I use now my model factory. So I create now a term structure Monte Carlo simulation model. Recall, this is my interface, which is uh, say providing forward rates and numerators. And I can use now my model factory. So let's use my model factory with these parameters, or maybe I do not like to type all these parameters. I'm a bit lazy. I just copy here this uh, parameter list. And I just provide here this parameter list now as variables. So there is a random variable factory. Um, so to follow numerical methods, uh, know that there are different ways of creating random variables. You, know, you could inject uh, automatic differentiation with this. We can choose a measure here. Let's choose maybe terminal measure. We can choose a simulation interpolation method. Okay, maybe you can forget about this argument. Let's start with a flat interest rate curve at 5% uh, using semi-annual time discretization. I do not want to use analytic bond prices. My volatility is say uh, 30%. Is that a good number? Yeah, it's maybe 30% is a good number. Um, I do not want to use um, um, this blending parameter. So just use a normal model. Uh, the correlation decay parameter should be zero. So correlation is one. Yeah. So this, this is a simple um, number of factors. So let's use one factor. So it is a one factor model, one brown emotion. Uh, let's lose, use 50,000 Monte Carlo paths yeah. and use some random number seed. Okay. So now if I ask here the guy, he is actually filling this in. Oops, this is, he's filling this in and I believe he's already using, yeah, he's using the right order of the parameters. So we have created using our model factory, I have created um, this, oops. Did I, did I do a typo? What is the return value? Ah, term structure, Monte Carlo simulation model. Ah, typo. Okay, so now we have created our interest rate model, our Monte Carlo simulation of the interest rate model. Yeah? So you can now check Okay, this guy likes to throw an exception. So you can now check that this guy is providing forward rates, okay? And he's also providing the numeria. So I can value financial products. Uh, let's value a zero copper bond at a certain maturity, say in five years. Um, so now there is also an implementation for a financial product. There is a term structure Monte Carlo product. And there is already an implementation of a zero copper bond. So there is here the interest rate bond that just takes a maturity as an argument.
So like we did it for the equity case, you can have a peek here into the implementation. And you see that the implementation of the zero copper bond is just asked for the numerator. Yeah, and then one divided by the numerator multiplied with the numerator at evaluation time gives you the value. Yeah, So it's just a zero copper bond. So let's calculate the value of this zero copper bond. So the value is now the product get value with that model. And let's print this value. Okay, so we can print this value. Let's run our little program. Okay, and we get a 77%. Well, how does this compare to the analytic value? Well, the analytic value of the bond, well, I have um, a time discretized forward rate model. So um, the analytic value of the bond is one plus the forward rate multiplied with the period length to the power of how many periods do I have? But how many periods do I have? I have maturity divided by the period length. This is the product of one plus L delta T over all the periods, but actually the zero cobalt bond price is one divided by that. Okay, so that should be the analytic value. Let's print the analytic value. Okay, no, so there is an error, but looks looks similar. Um, let's print this yeah, for the same model for say different maturities. So let's start here with maturity 0.5. And we have a model that runs 20 years. So let's maybe stop in 20 and go every half year step. So we have a loop over doubles, yeah? so maybe not so usual, but that should work. Yeah. And let's print now the error. for the different maturities. So I print the maturity and then maybe a tabulator and then I print the error. So now I'm doing this with the bond in a loop. Okay, so we see some, some errors. And now let's change the measure. You see also here the error is very small at the end and fairly large, yeah, sometimes at the beginning, yeah, 10 to the minus three we see. Let's change the measure to say spot. So I changed the measure now to spot measure. Okay, so this is a 10 to the minus three. Yeah? So we have fairly large errors here, but we have small, very small errors in the beginning. So it's actually exactly the other way around. Um, this is now the error of the bond value. Uh, what you could also say is you you compare not the value, you compare the yield. So the bond is an E to the minus RT. So I would like to know the R. Yeah? So I take actually the logarithm of the value. So this is the minus RT and I divide by the maturity and I take a minus and that this is then the yield of this bond. And I can also do this for the analytic and Calculate now the error, not on the bond value, but I calculate it on the yield. This is a better measure because bonds that are longer, yeah, uh, they can accumulate more errors. And now I get the error on a 
per annual basis. And let's see how it looks there. So this is now spot measure, 10 to the minus four in at the long end, 10 to the minus five and 16 or at the short end and terminal measure. Ten to the minus seven at the long end, but ten to the minus four at the short end. So you can you can plot this, and you then get this a picture. So this guy here is now terminal measure, and you see there is a zero. This is now the error. This is here the zero, and you see that the error is small at the long end, so at the higher maturity. Well, this is because under terminal measure, the last bond is analytic yeah? because this is our numeraria and then it's just expectation of one divided by one multiplied with the bond value observed today. This is analytic. So you see that this measure has a high error at the short time periods, and then the error goes away. Under the spot measure, you see my zero is now here. Under the spot measure, the picture is really different. I have a very small error here on the short side. Actually, if you look very close, there's also a dot here at this point, because the first numerea is analytic. This is one plus forward rate as observed as of today, yeah, invested over one period. This guy is analytic. And then I have an error that accumulates. And you see that this is fairly smooth while this here is noisy. The reason is that this is smooth because the next numeraire is always the previous numeraire multiplied with an additional interest rate. While this guy here is now the numeraire always using interest rates observed at a new time. So if you go back, you see that the spot measure is always using here an interest rate at the same time, adding another one to the product, while this guy here is for the full product using new interest rate in every time steps. So it's completely reshuffling the random variables. So this guy, the second guy is much smoother. And to complete the session, also note here that the range where the terminal measure has its errors is something like 10 to the minus four. Yeah? So this here is a 10 to the minus four. While here the range is really smaller, at least in the short, on the short end. Yeah? So the maximum value is here two times 10 to the minus four, and the maximum value here is a 10 to the minus three. Yeah? So you have um, more noise. So maybe let's finish this session here and we will investigate this a little bit further in the next session where we have another um, numerical experiment already in the slides here for the forward rates. You can also now look at this picture for the forward rates and we will learn more about uh, how this all depends on the numeraire and you see that the change of numeraire suddenly makes a difference to a numerical method. That was it for today, thank you.